Good morning. It is time for our midweek Bible study. We are, of course, still in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, as I said before, we're going to be there for quite some time as we finish up this entire book. That's where we're going to be going on Wednesday mornings here for a while, is finishing up the entire book of, uh, of Mark, the Gospel of Mark. Um, and we come back today, remember I, I mentioned before, when Jesus had sent out the twelve, there was that parenthetical insert concerning John the Baptist, the account of what was going on with John. And I, I told you we would come back to the report of the disciples, how they would come back and tell Jesus what they had done, and then the aftermath of that. And that's where we're coming back to today, starting at verse 30 uh, of Mark chapter 6. Um, we are going to be looking at uh, this um, and so, uh, but this also, this passage where the report starts brings us into an account of an event that is significant. And it's significant for this reason. Um, other than the death and the resurrection of Jesus, there are very few things that you can find in all four of the gospel accounts of Jesus' life and ministry. This is one of those. Uh, and I think that is significant because... Each of the gospel writers had kind of their own focus on what they were dealing with. And so sometimes they didn't include all of the things that Jesus did that the other gospel writers did think was important enough to include. And so when we find those things that do cross over all four of the gospel accounts, that tells us something, that it is a significant, significant event, significant enough that each of those four writers thought it necessary to include. Um, and so that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, I want to read to you from Mark chapter 6. We'll start at verse 30. I've, uh, I'll go down through verse 44. That's the entirety of the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll begin. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. <clears throat> and when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Father, we pause and we ask you, Lord, as always, to help us, to guide our thoughts, that, Lord, we might understand, to make our hearts tender enough to hear and to listen and to comprehend and to want to apply. Father, we come to you today hungry. That's how I am, hungry, Lord, to be filled by you. So, Father, help us to do that. Help us see how we can be satisfied today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jesus feeds 5,000. Um, the apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. So, this is the conclusion of what started earlier in the Gospel of Mark after he had set out the 12 and they came back and they reported back to him. Uh, and they were excited, I think, by the results of their mission. They wanted to tell Jesus. They wanted to tell Jesus all that they had done, all the healings, all the miracles that they had been able to perform through the Spirit's power. They wanted to tell Jesus everything they had taught. 
to make sure that he was accepting and was happy with what they had done. But Jesus was concerned more for their well-being. He said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Because here's a truth that we need to understand. Ministry, even in the Spirit's power, can still be taxing. There is a time and a place where anyone who wants to be a minister in the service of the gospel of Jesus Christ needs time to go away to a quiet place and rest and recharge. The crowds, it says, were coming and going such that they couldn't even have room to eat, time to eat. Uh, and so they went away in a boat to a desolate place. Yeah, um, the crowd may have even been larger than it ever had been before, if you think about this. Because before it was only Jesus that they were following after. And now all of a sudden the disciples have gone out and done similar things that Jesus had done. So it's possible that this crowd that gathered, probably back in Capernaum, was even larger than even anything Jesus had drawn by himself. And once again, it, it seems to me that they were just being thronged, that they were being surrounded by people to the point where they couldn't even take time to eat. And so Jesus suggested a retreat. Get away for a little while so that you can rest and recuperate. You need that. Um, so a little lesson here for those of us who might be spiritual workaholics. Don't be afraid to take time away to recharge. It's okay. So that's the plan. Let's get in a boat. We'll go off. We'll find a desolate place somewhere along the shoreline, somewhere away from Capernaum probably. We'll pull in. We'll have a nice quiet place to ourselves. But as we see, that plan kind of goes awry. Now, many of them saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. So that when Jesus goes ashore, he saw a great crowd, it says, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he gave, began to teach them many things. Now, again, the disciples are the ones who Jesus is concerned about. He wants them to come away to rest. And so he takes the mantle upon himself, as he usually would, and he begins to teach. Even though he had wanted some solitary time for his disciples, the crowd had other ideas. Um, and we, we have to remember something, you know, you'd think, well, how in the world did these people manage to get there ahead of them? The Sea of Galilee is not all that large. And if the boat that Jesus and his disciples were in hadn't put out from shore a great distance, say perhaps only a half a mile or so, they would have been easily seen. And somebody who watched them pull away could have easily saw and said, that's the boat we're looking at and just followed along on the shore. And depending upon the winds, it would have been quite easy for a crowd on foot to get to a place where the boat was pulling in before the boat had pulled in. So it's not unusual to think that this could have happened, that they could have been followed, and even people have gotten there ahead of the boat. So when Jesus does pull in, when the boat pulls into shore and Jesus steps out and he sees this large crowd, thousands, literally, he says he has compassion on them. Because he sees them as they are, like sheep without a shepherd. And a lone sheep without a shepherd to watch over it was in grave danger. The sheep might be able to find food for itself. I mean, sheep aren't that dumb that they can't find something to eat. Certainly, it would have been able to find water probably for itself. Again, they're, they're not, you know, uh, while we say sheep are not the smartest of animals, they're also not the dumbest. So they're going to be able to find food and water, but shelter? protection. So instead of being upset that the crowd has turned his plans for a retreat for his disciples around, he has compassion on the crowd and he begins to teach them many things. It's an opportunity for him to shepherd the lost sheep. Uh, and so he takes that. But the hour grows late, verses 35 and 36. And when it grew late, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. <clears throat> the late afternoon, early evening meal that the people of, of this time and culture would have partaken in was the main meal of the day. Anything they ate when they got up in the morning would have been very light fare. Again, whatever they ate, 
maybe during the midday would have been light fare. Now is when they're going to sit down and they're going to eat their main meal of the day. What, you know, the, the, their main sustenance is taken during that latter daytime evening meal. And the hour is now late. That time for that meal is approaching. And the disciples go to Jesus and they say, you know, Master, it's getting late. It's time for supper for these folks. And we're out here in this desolate place. There's nothing around here. You need to send them away so that they can go and find some food for themselves. The disciples, of course, have shifted from powerful ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ to normal, everyday, oh my goodness, we have an emergency and we don't have what it takes to do this. So Jesus challenges them in verses 37 and 38. He looks at them and he says, you give them something to eat. Hopefully, I th and I think what's going on here is, kind of, as I said, this is a challenge by Jesus. This is a, how are you going to think about providing for this larger crowd? What are you going to look to for the resources? Remember, the disciples had been sent out two by two, no money in their purse, no bag to carry extra provisions, a staff alone, to a walking stick, to learn to rely upon the provision of God. They had performed miracles. They had taught powerfully, it would be assumed, at least implied. And so they had been taught on this mission to rely upon God's provision and God's power. And Jesus turns to them and says, you give them something to eat. And what did they immediately do? You would hope that they would go, oh, man, we just need to pray. We need to turn to God. We need to rely upon God for his power and his provision here because we can't do this. But instead, they did the human thing. What do you want us to do? Go spend 200 denarii and, and buy enough bread to go to, to feed this many people? You have to understand, 200 denarii, a, a, a denarius was one day's wage, typically. So this is 200 days worth of work for one man. Did they have that much money between them? We don't know. Perhaps they did. But even if they did, it would have been an extravagant expenditure of funds to feed this crowd. And I think the disciples were probably a little stupefied. You know, that's why they asked the, uh, almost a rhetorical question. You really want us to go spend 200 bucks for this? 200, you know, 200 denarii? And so Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? What do you have at your disposal? And so they went and saw and they found out and they said five and two fish. The, the loaves, by the way, were probably not what we would think of as a loaf of bread. The loaves that these would have been would have been sufficient maybe for one person uh, at the outside, too, could have shared. And the fish were probably smoked fish, relatively small, again, one to two people. So in essence, what the disciples had at their disposal was enough food to feed about five to eight people. And so when they bring this back to Jesus, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. He says, all right. And I can almost hear the extra words that aren't written here. Jesus looking at the disciples and kind of shaking his head and saying, all right, I got this. Watch. Commands the people, it says in verses 39 to 42, he commanded them all to sit down in groups in the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. Now we know there's about 5,000 men. So it could have been 50 rows of 100 people or you know something like that with space there for people to walk through but anyway he, he had them sit down in these groups and then he took the five loaves and the two fish and he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing in other words he thanked god for the provision that was there thank god for what there was to share and then it says he broke the loaves and gave to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. Now, some interpreters have tried to say, well, he only really fed the 12. Well, there wasn't enough food there for the 12 to eat and be satisfied. As I said, there was maybe enough food there to feed five to eight people in total between the bread and the fish. 
some people say, well, he just broke up little tiny chunks and everybody just had a little tiny chunk. Well, I couldn't divide five loaves of bread and two fish amongst 5,000 people and give everybody a little tiny chunk. They'd have a little tiny crumb. And that's certainly not going to satisfy them. Something happens when Jesus starts breaking the bread and dividing up the fish. And as he was giving it to the disciples. <clears throat> and what I see is as pure an act of outright creation as there could possibly be. After all, Jesus, we believe, is the creative agent for our universe, for our existence. Jesus was the one that when the words were spoken, let there be light, let there be water, let there be this, <coughs> it was Jesus who was speaking to him. And so as Jesus gives thanks to the Father for the provision, looking up into heaven for God's blessing, he starts breaking the bread and dividing up the fish. And as he does, it just keeps multiplying and multiplying and multiplying, giving to the 12 food to carry out into the rows and into the groups until 5,000 men have been given enough bread and enough fish to eat such they are satisfied. And that word in the Greek is very clear. It doesn't just mean, oh, they sort of had enough. It means they had more than enough. They were fully satisfied by what they had consumed. This is a miracle because there's no way to really interpret this any other way than quite literally. As Jesus was breaking the bread and dividing the fish, it just kept multiplying miraculously. From nothing, Jesus was creating the bread and the fish, replicating it, if you will. I can only imagine how the disciples must have felt as they kept filling their baskets to carry it out to the people and distribute it to them and running back and getting more. And there was always more there. And then Mark concludes it with the final two verses. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces of the bread and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. A lot of discussion has gone on about the significance of 12 baskets. And I have my own opinion on the significance of it. And I'm going to share that with you. And, and basically it's this. Um, oops, sorry, my iPad decided to change screens. Uh, it's this. How many of the closest disciples did Jesus have? Twelve. How many of them were so quick to jump on God's provision? None of them. How many of them needed a reminder that when God provides, he will provide and provide in full and to overflowing? All 12 of them. I think there was a basket for each of them to carry so that each of them could look down and go, how in the world did this happen? We had five loaves of bread and two fish, and we just got done seeing 5,000 people be fed to fullness. And we still have leftovers. And so, uh, to me, this is just simply a reminder to each of those men that when God provides resources for a need, it is always more than sufficient. You see, they had focused on their own lack. Now we have five loaves and two fishes. We can't help 5,000 people. And maybe they didn't even have 200 denarii to go buy it. So they would have been like, we can't even go buy food for these people. We don't have enough money. But when God provides, there is no lack of resources. And I've said this before. We, and I, we heard this from Mark Clifton during one of our recent meetings, that God is under no obligation to provide the resources for our plans. But if we are seeking to follow God's plan, he will always more than abundantly provide the resources needed. And this is the lesson of the feeding of the 5,000, the primary primary most prominent lesson is simply this. When God provides the resources for his plan, you're going to have more than enough. And the accounting here is strict. 5,000 men. Might have been 5,005, might have been 49.95, but 5,000 men. Now, some people have tried to make a big deal of the fact with, yeah, and that didn't count the women and children. Were there women and children present? Probably. Probably. 
Was it a significant number? Perhaps not. So I, I've seen other people, other commentators or, or teachers try to make this out to be, there could have been 10 to 15,000 people there. I don't think we have to make it that because it's significant enough with 5,000. Were there perhaps more because some women and children were there? Yeah, perhaps. Did they eat too? Certainly. The point is, this is a huge incident, a huge event. And as I said before, why is this so significant? Well, other than the death and the resurrection of Jesus, there are very few things that are included in all four Gospels. This is one of them. It's as if God is trying to tap us on the shoulder and get our attention and say, pay attention to this. When I provide for my purposes, you will have no lack. If God is in it, the resources that are needed will be there, and they'll be there at the right time. Uh, <clears throat> plenty of uh, anecdotal stories of people praying for God to provide, and at just the right time, miraculously, he does. George Mueller <clears throat> ran a, a children's orphanage for years and years and years, operated on a strict basis of faith. And the story is told that one morning when he arrived at the, or for breakfast, the keepers of the, the orphanage came to him and said, we don't have any bread to feed the children. And then another one came and said, we're out of milk too. And a few moments later, you know, George, and George Mueller said, well, we need to pray. And so they prayed, asking for God to provide. And a few moments after that, a knock came on the door and they opened the door and it was from the local bakery and, the, and the, the, the person there said, we have an over, over, over abundance of bread. So we would like to donate bread to you. Perfect, right on time. And moments later, another knock came and it was a dairy delivery wagon. And the, the wagon driver said, my wagon is broken down right outside your, your orphanage here. I can't deliver this milk and I don't want it to go bad. So I'd rather just give it to you. God is never late. God always provides abundantly when we are seeking to do his will and seeking to glorify him. The disciples had lost that image in their own mind, even though they had just come back and reported to Jesus all that they had done and all that they had taught in God's power. And this was a reminder to them. And I think as they walked away with that basket of bread and fish, it had to be ringing home. Wow. We forgot very, very quickly what God had done. And there's also, of course, that practical lesson at the very beginning. There is a time to retreat from the busyness of ministry. Uh, we are human. We are not divine. We are not infinite. And as a result, if we don't take the time to come away and recharge and refresh, we can burn out. So let's take those and learn from them. As a church, obviously, we are struggling. Um, but that struggle also, I believe, brings opportunity for us to seek God's will, seek God's favor, and wait for God to miraculously resource his plan for Central Church. So as we seek that, I hope you'll continue to pray for us and look expectantly for what God will do. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you again, Father, for the lesson that your word teaches us. And thank you, Father, for the opportunity we have to study your word, to look into it, and, Father, to have it penetrate into our heart. So we ask you to use it today to your glory. We thank you, Father, for it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Keep those in Florida in your prayers. Uh, Hurricane Ian is going to make landfall sometime today. And it looks like it is going to be uh, a very, very powerful Cat 4, Category 4 hurricane. It could possibly strengthen even into a Category 5 hurricane before it makes landfall. It is going to cause massive destruction, uh, potentially. Um, so keep those in the path of that storm in your prayers. The first responders that are still there.
Uh, keep them in your prayers uh, during the day here. Thank you. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.